Hello. If everyone could take their seats, come on in, take your seats. We'll get started on our second panel. Thank you so much. We are back on track within four minutes. Pretty good. So I get to introduce Scott Hart. He's kicking off our next panel. Um, Scott and I were actually classmates, and we went on Charles Wilkinson's advanced natural seminar trip in 19... Uh, <laughs> 98. <laughs> and it was the year, it was the year after uh, the fires in Yellowstone, uh, and just a memorable, amazing experience that I think changed most of our lives. And uh, I'll hand it over to Scott. Well, thanks to everyone for coming back uh, for the second session this morning. As Alice mentioned, my name is Scott Hart. I'm a partner at Davis, Graham and Stubbs in the Environmental and Natural Resources Group. And as Alice also mentioned, I'm a lucky alumnus of CU uh, Law School. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the third year uh, se seminar uh, with Charles was an amazing experience. We visited uh, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, as Alice mentioned, and Alice and I were kind of teamed up as a student group to focus on wildlife issues and got to spend uh, many hours ruminating great thoughts about wolves and bison and uh, breaking down barriers to ecosystem management across uh, approximately uh, an 18 million acre area that um, Bob Kiter talked about this morning. Um, the, the, they were heady days, they, they were awesome days being a student here. I came to CU Law uh, specifically to do environmental and public lands law and my three years here mentoring with Charles and with uh, David Getch has absolutely cemented my decision to spend uh, a good part of the rest of my life doing exactly that. Um, it was a good decision. I guess the, uh, the one unintended consequence is that um, looking back 30 years, I've, I've actually had to spend an uh, amazing amount of my professional life tracking what I've done in six minute increments. Um, <laughs> as part of uh, meeting the perennial billable hour requirements of private practice. And um, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but for, for the students in the audience that are embarking on significant career decisions, it's um, something to think about. Um, I greatly appreciate the center's invitation to join you today, and I'm honored to be able to participate with our next esteemed group of scholars. Um, after the wonderful overview we had this morning on kind of some general principles, that are uh, at play in current uh, public land management policy. The next couple panels today are gonna focus in on um, more specific uses uh, of the public lands and potential conflicts that arise in connection with competing uses. And our group in particular has been asked to examine alternative approaches to navigating the historic dichotomy between economic development on the one hand and protection of the public lands on the other hand. And I'd like to just give a little historic backdrop and then we'll, we'll dive into the panel discussion. Um, since the first forest reservations and national parks were carved out of the public domain roughly 150 years ago, Yellowstone in 1871, one of the most polarizing and long-standing debates in public land policy has centered on delineating the appropriate balance between protection and development of public land resources. The debate historically pit, pitted commodity natural resource developers, timber, mining, oil and gas, against preservationists and wilderness advocates. While the, with the blooming conservation movement at the dawn of the 20th century came the first significant national efforts out of Washington to place checks on unmitigated development on the federal lands. While decidedly utilitarian in their views, the early conservationists advocated that public lands be managed for a variety of potentially competing uses. In its purest form, as originally advocated by Gifford Pinchot, who was the, the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service, the multiple use mandate gives federal land managers broad discretion to manage federal lands for the combination of uses that provides the greatest good for the greatest number over the long run. And so this, this eye of the beholder test, it could very easily mean something very different to you than the person that's sitting uh, behind you, uh, actually provided very little in the way of a specific management mandate. Um, although it did incorporate three key concepts that still permeate public land management policy today. 
First, that the public lands would remain in public ownership. Secondly, there was an element of protection that the public lands would, would be managed to prevent the kind of unchecked development that uh, occurred under prior uh, laissez-faire approaches. And thirdly, sustainability, the concept that public lands would be managed in a manner that promotes long-term sustainable use. Dur dur during the boom that followed World War II, uh, conflicts over competing uses of public lands intensified as demand for both commodity resources and recreation reached unprecedented levels. In 1960, the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act provided clear legislative recognition that the national forests were to be managed in a sustainable manner for a variety of uses, including, including outdoor recreation, range, timber, watershed, and fish and wildlife. However, like Pinchot's original rendition, the Multiple Use Sustain Yield Act provided little in the way of specific guidance as to the exact mix of uses that should be allowed on any particular parcel of land. Uh, the Multiple Use Sustain Yield Act was followed by other statutes such as FLIPMA and NIFMA that further elucidated the multiple use uh, standard and provide a planning framework for uh, making land use uh, uh, decisions. However, the courts have pretty much uniformly held that, that none of those multiple use prescriptions or, or, or mandates actually prescribe any particular mix of uses uh, on the ground. Environmental and wilderness values came to permeate public land policy after 1960 with the enactment of the 1964 Wilderness Act and the array of environmental laws that followed uh, NEPA's enactment in 1971. And while this environmental overlay provided some brackets, certainly some significant brackets, on the federal land manager's discretion to uh, allow certain uses on certain lands, the broad prescriptive multiple use management uh, mandate still survives on the majority of the federal lands. And we're talking basically BLM lands and, and Forest Service lands. Uh, this statutory regime makes federal land management policy highly subject to the political will of the executive branch. And accordingly, over the past few decades, certainly over the 30 years or so that I've practiced, we've seen broad swings in how the federal lands have been managed under changing presidential administrations. These shifts have revealed themselves through numerous types of executive actions that include dueling solicitors' opinions, shifting guidance memos to field officers, um, uh, changing regulations, we've seen that you know, in abundance now with the NEPA regulations that were just being talked about, the water of the U.S. regulations, ESA regulations, and also the issuance of conflicting executive orders as we've seen, for example, with Bears Ears National Monument. Increasing understanding of the implications of climate change has added yet another layer of complexity to federal land management. Now one could envision, at least envision, that having a uh, common understanding of the effects of climate change would be a unifying force that would provide a common base for, for, for all of us as, as folks are trying to figure out exactly what the appropriate mix of uses are on the federal lands. And, and we're definitely seeing that on some fronts. Um, certainly on my side, on the private practice side, we're seeing um, extractive industries and companies around the globe um, developing you know, really for the first time, not only broad aspirational goals with respect to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but very specific targets. Now, of course, they're, you know, they're not legally enforceable, so some folks could still consider those potentially pretty soft. But we are seeing, you know, for example, with BP, been in the news quite a bit recently, um, companies, whether it's mining companies, oil and gas companies, are um, boring down and developing specific measurable ob objectives to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, some of the more specific proposals to combat climate change, such as um, banning all oil and gas production from federal lands, or, or at least banning new leasing of oil and gas on federal lands, or prohibiting uh, hydraulic fracking across the board, have made developing multi-sector um, coalitions and common ground more complicated. Uh, uh, so, so the debate rages on in terms of what exactly is the appropriate mix, uh, even in the face of, uh, of the climate change uh, information that we're uh, gaining and digesting every day.
So our conversation this morning, I think, is going to step back a bit from, from the substantive de debate of how much development should we have on the public lands versus how much protection we should have on the public lands. And we're going to explore some alternative perspectives or models for how land use decision making can be approached in an inclusive manner as um, society's values and objectives evolve in the face of new information and new technologies. Concepts of regionalism, tribal sovereignty, urbanism, rural community values, cultural resource protection, and not to be forgotten, science-based decision making, all come into play when considering how land use decisions should best be made as we continue moving towards a cleaner energy economy. And we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, three prolific writers and thinkers that I'd like to briefly introduce. I suggest you do go check out their, the, the law school websites for each of these three panelists. You'll find a comprehensive bibliography of many articles, publications, and papers that, that these folks have presented that I think you'll find inspiring and thought-provoking on some of the issues we're going to be exploring this morning. So our first speaker is going to be Professor Annie Eisenberg, who is closest to me here. Uh, Annie is an assistant professor of law at the University of South Carolina School of Law. And prior to joining the law school faculty in 2016, uh, she was a fellow uh, in land use law at, at the West Virginia College of Law. And in 2017, she founded the Environmental Law Clinic at the University of South Carolina, which gives students opportunities to provide transactional and advisory legal services to nonprofits and other underrepresented groups on issues related to land use and sustainability. Our, our second speaker is going to be Professor Jessica Shoemaker. And Jess is an associate professor of law at the Nebraska College of Law. She's in the middle here. Um, in addition to her teaching and research activities at the law school, Jess is a founding fellow at the Rural Futures Institute at the University of Nebraska and is a fellow at the Center for Great Plains Studies, whose mission is to foster interdisciplinary study of and appreciation for people, cultures, and natural environments in the Great Plains. And then third, down at the end, uh, is uh, Re Professor Rebecca Sosi. And Rebecca is a Regents Professor of Law at the James E. Beard College of Law at the University of Arizona. And Rebecca also serves as a faculty co-chair of the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program and is a special advisor to the Provost for Diversity and Inclusion. Rebecca is also very active outside the law school. She's a member of the Board of Directors for the Grand Canyon Trust. And she's also a tribal court judge and serves as an associate judge for the San Carlos Tribal Court of Appeals and an associate justice for the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation Supreme Court. Um, and with that, <laughs> Professor Eisenberg. Okay, um, thank you so much, Scott, for kicking us off, and thank you to the symposium organizers uh, for the chance to be here. It's already been such a great event, and I'm really glad to be a part of it. Um, so I'm going to talk today about conservation, livelihoods, and self-determination, accounting for trade-offs in the public lands regime. So I write about law and rural community economic development. Um, a few years ago, before I joined the faculty at South Carolina, I was working as a fellow in land use law uh, in West Virginia, as Scott mentioned. And I was writing about coal miners and, and fossil fuels and the history of environmental injustice in Appalachia. And just as a quick aside, this has been a very humbling month for me. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was in southern West Virginia talking to residents of West Virginia about coal mining. And now I'm here in Colorado talking to uh, what I presume is mostly an audience of, of Westerners about public lands. And so I, I want to emphasize I, I appreciate that I'm an outsider in a sense to these issues. So to the extent that anyone would like to educate me uh, later after you disagree with everything I say, I would love to hear the feedback. Um, so anyway, while I was living in West Virginia um, and just starting to think about land use and the role of natural resources in, in rural community economic development, I had never thought about the public lands uh, before, I'll confess. And just at that moment, Ammon and Ryan Bundy uh, led their uh, uh, group and forcibly took over the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. 
um, purporting to do so in the name of the rights and livelihoods of, of ranchers and their communities, even though the ranchers and local residents of Harney County, where the refuge is located, um, were pretty much horrified, as far as I understand, and, and not in support of this move, and actually harmed by what the group was doing. Um, but this caught my attention while I was thinking about coal in Appalachia, um, because a lot of what they were saying sounded like similar tensions and themes that I was seeing um, and hearing people talk about in coal country. So tensions between federal oversight and livelihoods, tensions between conservation efforts and livelihoods, otherwise known as jobs versus environment. Um, and then these populist movements, um, you know, you've seen it, people rising up against the war on coal, populist movements of white, mostly male rural residents claiming that their way of life is dying um, and that it's some form of injustice. Most people in my world, I think I can safely be called a coastal liberal urban elite at this point. Um, most people in my world, very understandably, are, are ready to dismiss these groups, and I, I, again, very understandably so, um, as dangerous right-wingers, um, which I think is, is absolutely correct. But I, I did wanna know whether, if we, we dismiss and cease uh, inquiry or discussion, is there some lesson we should be learning that we might be missing if we're not thinking about this at a bit of a deeper level? Um, so I decided to, to look into this issue just to see if there were any takeaways um, beyond stopping at that point. Um, so just as a little bit of background, again, that has been mentioned a few times already, this is um, drawn from a Law Review article by Bruce Huber at, at Notre Dame who's written about the public lands. Um, and he uh, categorizes the public lands regime as, as falling into two phases for purposes of, of thinking about the kinds of uses that, that I'm thinking about. So um, historically, you had something that looked more like an open access model. Um, yes, we saw the trends in terms of trending toward conservation of large amounts of, of land, um, but you, you did have more of a laissez-faire approach among federal agencies to the actual management of the public lands. Um, so the open access model was actually tr still trying to get people to uh, settle western lands. You, you had encouraging and or allowing and or overlooking um, the development and uses of natural resources, and then you had um, relatively minimal or hands-off oversight. Uh, but ever particularly since, I, I'd say, the passage of the environmental law framework of the 70s, um, federal agencies have been getting more involved um, and uh, embracing what Huber has called the, the proprietary model, where um, this is more of the view at, of public lands as trust resources held for the public, for the many values that they um, contribute to the public. So this has involved increased conservation efforts um, and increased oversight. And so with the transition between these two phases, you've seen people chafing under that increased federal involvement. Um, and that tension has taken on a variety of different forms. Some in the form of social movements advocating local control, like the Wise Use Movement, the Sagebrush Rebellion, and the County Supremacy Movement. Um, but other manifestations ha have come in the form of local and state efforts to retake control legally of public lands um, in what some call the land transfer movement that maybe tries to have a bit more of a le legitimate um, legal and political air and less of a populist one. Um, and so as I've said, uh, and here's one of the Bundy brothers, um, as I said, I, we are of course correct to be very disturbed <laughs> by these movements. Um, especially because sort of where we are as a country right now, political polarization related to some of these tensions goes beyond sage grouse versus ranching permits, right? Um, some of these movements have been associated with explicit racist and white supremacist aims uh, in addition to goals based on the more kind of innocent sounding objectives related to earning a living. Um, and I really recommend journalist Leah Satilli's podcast, Bundyville, um, for anyone interested in learning more about uh, these issues. 
Um, and in a related theme, it's definitely not clear that the, the sort of self-proclaimed folk heroes of these movements are acting in good faith, especially because we can see direct ties to sort of higher level actors, um, conservative politicians in the background who are seeking to benefit from a more sympathetic populist face to what are ultimately aims to derive private profit uh, from public lands. <clears throat> um, all of that said, Here's what I think the problem is. A problem is, there are a lot of problems here, I think. Um, a problem that I think that is worthy of attention um, and that I think gets lost in these conversations and kind of really distracting and extreme high profile episodes um, is that the vastness of federal land holdings in the West does have real implications for people's livelihoods, for poverty, for community economic development, and for the prospect of regional self-determination. Um, and I think we, we need to go a little bit further in the conversation over public lands, and I really appreciated that the earlier panel this morning touched on this. Um, we need to be able to talk about that um, and acknowledge those trade-offs. So one way, way to view it, um, Please don't throw tomatoes at me. Uh, so I'm teaching property law this semester for the first time and, and learning about feudalism. Um, and feudalism has historically been where the king owns all the land and the peasants are granted limited access uh, to work on the land but with really limited rights. And it did occur to me that sounds kind of like the public lands a, a little bit. And so I would ask people to just think about other instances in history, other instances in other countries where you have one really big landholder um, and ask whether there are justice implications that arise out of that, even if it's really good what that landholder is doing with the land holdings. Um, so it's really unfortunate that the loudest spokespeople on these tensions are the least sympathetic people uh, because their extremeness ends up masking what are ultimately real problems with not just jobs, but limited prospects for regional self-determination. Um, so I'm 100% pro-conservation and it's absolutely important, but I think we need to recognize that when you do conserve land, you can't do other things with it. And the other things that you can't do with it are not just ranching, but also building affordable housing or a youth center or whatever else your community might have wanted nearby if it had the autonomy uh, and the avenues to make those decisions. And so I include this quote here to show that it's not just right-wing nut jobs uh, who experience frustration with this arrangement. Um, there are other people who, who do but obviously don't resort to violence. Um, so this is from a law professor uh, in Idaho who said species protection has hit this region hard. There are families that have been farming these federal lands for generations but do not own it. There is an odd tenant farmer reality. Some of these families have been here for generations but do not own any land. This creates immense hostility, especially when new conditions are placed on those permits. Um, and for another perspective on that, Michelle Bryan, another law professor at Montana, has an interesting article outlining how federal agencies engage with regional local governments in their coordination on public lands and how the local government officials who are, are also um, not necessarily very, very, very conservative, they often feel dismissed, excluded, or misunderstood in those processes. Um, so I think there's room to think about how we can do that better. Um, and so another thing, another twist to this that I think deserves our attention, uh, when, when I have these conversations with folks, their response usually is, and I think this is part of the national conversation, that the public lands belong to all of us. Um, and when you get someone doing something crazy, demanding more local control of public lands, they, they say, no, but, it, but it's all of ours. And that's true, obviously it's true, yes. Um, but I think we might wanna think about that a little more in terms of what that means. Uh, I have an article in the Boston College Law Review that just came out. It's called Distributive Justice uh, and Rural America. And it's looking at that kind of rationalization of putting burdens on particular groups or uh, continuing burdens on particular groups. Um, 
And so I don't think Joe Sachs here is saying that localism is the one and only priority, but when we uh, tell a particular group to bear a particular burden, and the burden I'm referring to is more limited regional autonomy and self-determination, when we tell a group to bear that burden because it's better for collective welfare, I think we need to at least acknowledge that that can get tricky from a perspective of morality or ethics or justice or fairness or whatever you want to call it. So the Green New Deal, uh, going back to the name of the symposium, where does this come in? I actually think the Green New Deal is an excellent idea substantively for addressing rural socioeconomic marginalization generally. Um, I think rural communities have not been treated well through an environmental justice lens or an economic justice lens. Um, and a massive aggressive effort to address both of those inequities stands to go a long way to revitalizing rural communities by these really important metrics. My question going forward that, that was also mentioned in the prior panel is whether the Green New Deal can figure out a way to get ahead of past weaknesses that we've seen in both environmental law regimes and the public lands regimes, which is that they've been heavily top down and in being so top down, they have arguably failed to account for rural realities on the ground and also failed to get sufficient rural buy-in. So my hope is that the drivers behind the Green New Deal will be thinking about ways to afford better avenues for local and regional input so people affected don't just view it as yet another limit on their autonomy and prospects for self-determination. Thank you. Thanks to have to go after Annie. That's rough. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm Jess Shoemaker from the University of Nebraska, um, and I am so grateful to be here. I have learned a ton already um, and really just appreciate the conversation and the engagement that has been happening across uh, in the panels and outside of the panels. Um, when Sarah invited me, uh, she acknowledged in her invitation email that I'm not in the main a public land scholar which I thought was a very generous uh, and gracious description at the time because I'm not really at all a public land scholar. Um, but as I've been thinking about uh, this symposium and preparing for this panel, um, I found myself increasingly chastened by that description, which is still generous and uh, accurate. Uh, I'm actually a property scholar, uh, which you would think would include public lands, right? But that sort of doesn't. So from the property scholarship world, when we think about property, land tenure, ownership. We're thinking about sort of everything but the public lands. Um, and I have focused particularly on uh, rural landscapes and the specific questions about who actually owns private lands in rural America and how did it get to be owned that way and agricultural land tenure in particular. And then the complex property and governance relationships within the American Indian reservations in the US and then more recently in Canada as well. Um, and so from a property scholar's perspective in Nebraska, just one state over to the east, um, if I think about the public lands, uh, or sort of, in, I've thought about them more than this, but sort of in general, right, the sort of first perception is that the public lands exist as this sort of perfect open canvas of opportunity in which all of the demands that are not being satisfied in the private land sphere, we could sort of take that from the public lands or we could make that work in some way um, and that it is this just sort of perfect space to solve all problems. Um, without all of the kind of sticky individual entitlements and embedded networks of private property that we deal with um, outside of the public lands context. Now, of course, when we peel back that layer even just a little bit, uh, the public lands are clearly not that sort of purely open, untouched canvas. Um, and in fact, there are many durable, private, property-ish claims or property claims within those spaces. And Bruce Huber's uh, article uh, that Annie mentioned is, of course, a great one of many that have looked at those durable, private claims to public space. Um, but also, the flip side of that is that when I think about property scholarship and land tenure outside of the public land space, space you know, that's not really all private either. And in fact, what's interesting about property law and land tenure and land ownership institutions and the private law sphere is that it's actually all public, right? We, we bestow state enforcement rights, the state defines and regulates those property rights. And so although we think often in kind of 
rhetoric about property as if it's this pure individual liberty space of autonomy and exclusion and uh, uh, sort of kingdom or queendom of one, right? In fact, it's a delegation of state sovereignty to an indiv individual. And so the argument is that that delegation should reflect all of the same common good public values that any other exercise of a public choice should. And so I think with uh, sociologists like Jess Gilbert and others who have looked particularly uh, in the context of uh, black agrarianism and the struggle for black farmers in the South in particular to access land and to access agriculture and opportunities in that way, um, they say in their, their uh, work on the subject that all land is a set of values and a store of wealth. And I feel like that is really true, of course, of both public lands and private lands. And so what I wanna do in the few minutes that we have together is try to think about how to kind of integrate these two topics, the, the obviously interconnected lands that all store values and also wealth and the choices that we make about them, whether it's the pronghorn that we heard about earlier that don't stick within the boundaries of, of course, public lands or private lands, but cross both, but of course, all the economic, social, environmental consequences that also cross these boundaries. So these wider themes about lands and livelihoods, about how we design systems of land tenure and land relationships that are based on equity and address past harms, including the, in particular, the disposition and displacement of indigenous peoples from many of these lands, and then also potential new visions for managements and relationships with these lands, especially in light of climate change, but other changing conditions as well. So on one level, I'm here as an emissary from the private property scholarship world to say, we haven't figured it out either. Uh, but these the difficult challenges about balancing economic and everything else in terms of consequences, but also equity and justice and sustainability, we're having these same conversations um, and we should maybe work and think together a little bit more. So I want to try to talk about two specific examples of uh, possible relationships and the kinds of work with respect to private land ownership or reservation land ownership issues and how that might inform how we think about either private claims to public spaces or just the future of public spaces. And I say this with complete humility in that I will raise more questions and conclusions and I suspect you all have many more thoughts than I, so I'm hoping to sort of spark a conversation, uh, uh, if anything. But I think when we think through, sort of before I get to these two examples, if I were to uh, think in terms of sort of the meta challenge, uh, that seems to me to transverse environmental law, public lands law, but is particularly acute perhaps in property scholarship, is this tension of how we balance the real concrete lived experiences whether it's of communities or ecosystems or wildlife or landscapes in the more natural context, uh, where they are organic and evolving, sometimes wild, even chaotic, right? these concrete experiences, uh, with the contrast to the way the law works. So the law by nature, its job is to impose order, to create categories for things, to draw lines, to make property <laughs> as a category and a concept. And I really think a lot about the ways in which the law as a system of order and organization has great benefits, right? It, it makes things efficient, it helps us have stable entitlements, it makes our market work uh, for good and for bad, right? But it's, it's ordering in lots of ways. But there's also costs to that uniformity and costs to the cohesion that's imposed in these, particularly in the more top-down uh, legal structures, uh, in the loss of imagination of the way that things might otherwise be. So as we sort of internalize law as a language in a way that we think about the world, it can often be difficult to imagine a land tenure system, a property system, a legal system, a world that isn't defined within those same categories. So what do we do with that? Now I know in this room, there's a lot of people who are much more export, expert than I am in terms of adaptive management and management approaches for complex systems in the natural and ecological worlds. Uh, but I guess my kind of meta question uh, is in line with others who have thought about whether we can try to make the law more adaptive as well. So to try to bridge this concrete experience and the sort of essentializing nature of the law and create pathways to create space for flexibility in the kind of iterative, experimental, evolving, um, new visions kind of way. 
So I want to propose again two kind of, I don't have a ton of time, I'm gonna give two kind of property-based ideas um, of how this might work and maybe some connections to public lands, although I'd love to kind of continue that in conversation. So the first is about, I'm gonna talk about what I know, which is private property itself, right? The, the mythical fee simple absolute. So for the law students in the room, right? Um, I actually had my students uh, this year in property do walk up music for the fee simple absolute, which is like the you know hallelujah chorus and things. And when I said fee simple, because it holds such a sort of honored place in our uh, legal discourse and in our social conversations uh, and in our economy. Uh, so if American public lands are seen as kind of the great experiment, I think American fee simple absolute absolute private property is often seen as like the great accomplishment. So when we think about private property, we think about this institution of ownership that's the highest and best set of rights that we could achieve, that's unshackling us from these bounds of feudalism, right? That uh, maybe, right, but that was our goal, that we were sort of freeing ourselves from the Lord uh, and constructing this ideal of ownership that was about dem democracy, enfranchisement, engagement, distributed ownership, all of these great things. And it's become so essential to the way that we think about the world that in some sense, fee simple absolute is taken as a given, right? Like the property system has reached its end point of evolution. And in terms of private lands, the fee simple absolute is the best we can do and why would we even question it? Now part of that is also goes to this nature of how the law works and how property works, which is that property in particular and private claims to public lands and land management in general, you know, tends to be a thing that we think stability matters for especially, right? If we want people to invest in resources, to develop attachments to place, that stability, certainty, uniformity, these are all high ideals of property and of land claims. And so the fee simple absolute becomes this category that is hard for us to think of could we transform it to something else? So I'm here to tell you that we could, that there are lots of other options, right, beyond sort of what we think of with the, the walk-up music, hallelujah chorus, be simple, absolute. We could think of other things. And in fact, people are thinking and debating about other ideas of ownership. Uh, so I just want to do this very quickly, but one will be familiar, particularly in this room, which is just to question whether the fee simple, absolute, the kind of core institution of ownership outside of public lands, whether it can persist through climate change or whether climate changes to the physical landscape are going to require changes to the institution of ownership. So Professor Sprankling has talked about um, whether this will require adaptation in the institutions of ownership, whether it's about changing physical boundaries or physically changing characteristics of the property, changes in terms of what the uses might be valued as or might be possible, whether that's rising sea level or drought or fires, um, but also whether the time horizon of into perpetuity makes sense, whether rooted in a particular physical space when that physical space is, is in fact changing rapidly, whether that makes sense. Uh, this has also been sort of debated, this question of whether this institution that we take as a given uh, makes sense in a more urban context. So, and this is from scholars who are uh, more law and economics minded, might be on a more conservative end of the spectrum. They're also questioning whether this institution of economic or engine, the currency of our economy, whether it's the right thing going forward. So if you think about a, a city block with lots of different people having veto rights in terms of how that city block might get redeveloped, uh, maybe that doesn't make sense in the more urban landscape to have all of these rights to exclude that come with fee ownership, that maybe there's like an anti-commons or something like that happening. And maybe we should imagine a property ownership that floats, right, to different places within the city in a reorganized way, or that's callable under certain conditions through some sort of development covenants or things like that. And then of course, this all matters for equity a lot too. So a project that I'm working on right now, which I'm not gonna talk about too much, but I'd love to talk to anybody about after as well, um, is actually, so Fee Simple was designed about agrarianism, right? The ideal was that this was the mechanism that we were gonna achieve this diversified, sustainable pattern of stewards on the land, homesteading property, and we would have a non-feudal agricultural system. But in fact, what we've seen is that the fee simple, our core essentialized institutions of ownership, have not actually done that, right? And we have highly concentrated agricultural ownership, highly industrialized agricultural practices, highly absentee, like most of these owners own lots of property and now rent it to 
farmers who are tenant farmers. Uh, and if you're a tenant farmer, you're more likely to be a farmer of color. If you're a landowning farmer, you're almost in certainly white. It's 98% white, and that's not by mistake. That was the purpose of homesteading and the expenses of colonialism and slavery and other race-based exclusions in property. We constructed white land ownership in agriculture, uh, and now it's just become more concentrated, more absentee, and so maybe the fee simple isn't working there either. We haven't sort of created the rights that are working for the society that we want. And so that's all very private property specific. I share it just to provoke the idea that we can redesign even the things that we hold most core to us. Now this might be totally visionary and not practical, and I'm gonna talk more about sort of how we might get to these sorts of places. But this speaks to public lands questions too. So I know that grazing rights, just as one example, um, is kind of the third rail, and I probably shouldn't even talk about something like changing the institution of a grazing right. Um, and they've been historically very difficult to reform, but these are particularly durable private claims to rangeland that are fixed and really inherited in deep ways that are connected to the requirement that you own base property or have access to base property um, and are uh, entrenched and embedded and grandfathered in and renewed over and over that not only impacts the economics and the environment, but also these same agricultural questions about equity and access. Like who do we give these rights to? Whose rights are recognized and who is excluded? Now, I will also just say that as much as this might sound visionary and not practical, I'm gonna to get to sort of the how in a second. Um, it's also important to note that we've changed systems like grazing rights, individual entitlements to resources, property systems a lot, right? We tend to think of it as a stable, entrenched, essential, natural thing that is not touchable. Uh, but in fact, we moved from feudalism to the fee simple. We moved from commons to the grazing act. We moved to uh, public accommodations laws so that businesses can no longer uh, exclude people based on race or other protected classes from their lunch counters. We created condominiums. We created private interest communities when those things didn't exist. We created things like implied warranties of habitability that says that it's no longer legal to lease your property below a certain quality for a person's house, right? We changed what your rights were and we made all of those choices, choices that were pluralistic and dynamic and changed the way we think about the world around us. And so I guess my main pitch is we could do it again, right? Um, now, what it takes, I think, is in the same spirit of this kind of adaptive management idea of more flexible space for not just essential legal categories, but the kinds of grassroots social movements that percolate up to larger legal reform. And so I wanna end with my second and last example, um, which is to think about what I would probably conceive of as the least flexible space in terms of land tenure and land reform, and that's trust land within the uh, US American Indian reservations. Um, and this is an area that I've worked on quite a bit. So uh, if anyone questions the power of how we define property institutions and property rights, you only have to look to the history of federal Indian law to see the way that land reform and property law has been weaponized to make very intentional uh, community, social, economic changes, and those consequences are still being felt within reservation communities today, where mu much land, not all land, but much land is held in this federal trust status uh, for either the tribal government, tribal corporation, or for individual allottees, um, often a mix of those people. Uh, and there's a federal land manager. Now, it's not public lands, but it's a federal land trustee um, with the same sort of or similar uh, complex questions. Now, um, the talk last night was so interesting and I just have to kind of take one quick deviation uh, because I was so struck by the chart that showed the one-way ratchet of increasing federal protection for uh, federal, for public lands, increasing protection, increasing the numbers of acres that are under federal lands. Um, if we had a chart that showed a one-way ratchet of what's happened in terms of indigenous lands, it would go in the exact opposite direction. Um, and that would not just be from, although this is of course a huge and important part, not just the initial dispossession and displacement through treaties or removal or other reservation policies, and that of course caused a huge dip, but Teddy Roosevelt himself, right, our person who we like 
applaud for his conservation objectives, uh, he's the same person who applauded the reaching in to reservation property systems and forcing the sale of so-called surplus lands to non-Indians uh, and the allotment of what had been tribal properties managed under indigenous land tenure systems to individual allottees for the explicit purpose of assimilation. And he's the one who said, uh, this is the mighty pulverizing engine that will dismantle the tribal mass, right? This was Roosevelt, who we applaud in lots of ways. So people are complicated, but that did result in more loss of indigenous land. So from uh, the allotment period itself, we went from 138 million acres of land reserved for indigenous people within reservations. Of course, before that, it was exponentially greater. But just from allotment and forced land sales, we went down to lost another 90 million, not we, I'm not indigenous, but the, the indigenous peoples lose another 90 million acres, go down to 48 million. Now that stopped with the Indian Reorganization Act and was returning some lands to tribal trust. So uh, First Nation, or sorry, I just came from Canada, <laughs> tribal governments in the United States uh, and individual Latis have 56 million acres and land in trust right now. Um, but I think that that one-way ratchet is still going down, right? So Frank Palmersheim did this really interesting empirical study of uh, the land into trust process, the way in which uh, tribal governments can either purchase or in other ways acquire land and put it back into the trust as a way to preserve jurisdiction and preserve that land. Uh, and from 2000 to 2012, looking at five Great Plains states, he showed that the land into trust process, which is so highly contested, state of South Dakota sues every time virtually uh, tribes try to pursue a land into trust acquisition, um, that 8,000 acres of land in these five states over 12 years went into trust, while 64,000 acres went out in the trust to fee process, which is eminent domain proceedings, condemnation proceedings, and also any time an indigenous person wants to transfer their property to a non-Indian spouse or family member, uh, losing that trust status in that way. So uh, the trust status, uh, I'm gonna wrap up here, but the trust status is another uh, system, property system, that gets heavily critiqued because of the way that the federal government as land manager uh, is very controlling, right? Uh, limits the degree of alienation, the way in which land can be used for credit, can be used to unlock wealth. Uh, and so uh, there's a, a good amount of critique. Uh, but at the same time, the trust status is important because it preserves jurisdiction in the sort of jurisdictional algorithm that the Supreme Court has created, which often requires land ownership as a prerequisite to tribal jurisdiction. So the narrative, when we think about, well, what do we do with the system that most people agree has significant problems, income, wealth, all of the other things, um, is to privatize, right? So go to the magic, be simple. Let the walk-up music sound, be simple, absolute, privatize, it will unlock wealth, and this will sort of magically transform indigenous communities, um, or keep the status quo, or make little tinkers around the edge. But this, and this is the thing I've, I've written about quite a bit, um, so if you take Scott's general suggestion to read my articles, there's more to this here, but there's a whole kind of range of options, which include the process by which we could imagine a more pluralistic reclaiming of indigenous land tenure systems, which would require space for flexibility, uh, an iterative experimentation and uh, imaginings of what property could be. That's not privatized and not keep the status quo. Now, the main stopper here, impediment, uh, is the degree to which the federal land manager refuses to give up control. So although tribes are sovereign, although tribes, we recognize the inherent sovereignty of indigenous peoples, uh, in terms of land governance, there's very, very little space. And even when we applaud things like uh, there's a 2012 act called the Hearth Act that's supposed to sort of reclaim tribal uh, discretion about tribal trust leases, get the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, out of the way. Um, it requires in every instance that the tribe has to pass leases, leasing regulations that get approved by the secretary. All of the lease revenues and lease copies have to be given to the secretary for approval first, or for record keeping first. And the tribe's regulations have to be consistent with the federal government. And that consistency hook is persistent throughout all of the things that are billed as, let's make it more pro-tribal sovereignty. So it's really the federal government, right? This kind of anti-disruption problem, which we see in case law about land claims, which we see in land reform proposals, where we're very anti anything that messes up stable property entitlements. 
but I just came from Canada where stable property entitlements are being disrupted, uh, both in terms of Aboriginal title claims and in much broader and much more discretionary land reforms, right? The possibility for a whole range of uh, reserve-based property systems or territorial-based property systems. Um, and so it's possible to do something much more than that. Now, ultimately, um, I end where I started, which is I still look to the public lands as this sort of, per not perfect, but, but exciting, <laughs> Sarah's like not perfect, uh, but exciting canvas where uh, the kinds of co-management or collaborative governments that we saw through proposals and efforts like Bears Ears as holding so much promise, both for the future of public lands management, but also for this larger project of reimagining property and land relationships and land systems outside of public lands as well. Um, I will end there for the sake of time and I can't wait to hear Rebecca talk much more about that. Good morning. I am so pleased and honored to be here. Thank you for those amazing presentations that have been so thoughtful. Um, thank you to Alice and Sean for everything you did to bring us here to this room. Thank you for the wonderful faculty, for Sarah and Charles. This is always such a welcoming place for me and I've learned so much since I was a law student. I, I've come here to learn and I just really appreciate it. And thanks to my wonderful colleague, John Leshy, for your remarks last night, which have actually helped me think more about what my message ought to be to you this morning. And I, I want to take the privilege of also looping back to something that Charles said in his introduction last night, which was amazing. He personified the public lands and asked us to think of the public lands as an entity, as a being, in their collective identity, which is very complicated, as Professor Leshy told us. But I love that image, because if you actually hold the embodiment of something in your mind, you have to envision it. And I'm not a PowerPoint person, sorry, just not. But I love the slides. And if I could give a slide of what I would want to project it is those lands in their beauty, in their majesty, in their incredible character as they were at the moment of creation. As they were when the indigenous peoples of this land maintained a relationship, which some have questioned as ownership, and certainly under your, your view, um, maybe it wasn't that kind of fee simple ownership, Maybe it was something more closely attuned to this thing that we like to think of as stewardship. But whatever it was, it was a relationship between people and this embodied land. And that relationship does have an identity. It has a continuing identity. At the University of Arizona, we've been in discussions about the whole idea of a land acknowledgement. That is a best practice now for institutions of higher learning so that you can show who is part of this land and has been since time immemorial. And so I honor the indigenous nations of this place where I am invited to speak to you. And I think about that in a very careful manner at Arizona because it is a complicated history and it's an intertribal history and one has to be very respectful in that. So that's the relationship that I want to engage. Um, I am also struck by um, that idea of a philosophy and Alan talked about that. What is our philosophy going to be? And the late Dean Getches, who was transformative in so many ways to the public lands issue, talked about native cultures over time in that way, the wisdom that is situated in place as giving rise to a philosophy of permanence. How do people permanently live on these lands without destroying the lands and themselves in the process? That's the challenge. 
And those philosophies that come from indigenous epistemologies are philosophies of survival. They're philosophies of resilience over time. So I would like to bring all of that into our thinking. And based on what um, Professor Leshy said last night, he said, we own the public lands. And I'm going to go with that. If we own the public lands, we own the problem of climate change because that's one third of our nation. So we, all in this room, own that problem. Indigenous peoples own 56 million acres of trust land, more or less. They own the problem of climate change. The land, the water, the ecosystems within these regions are fragile, but they're also resilient. But what is the knowledge that we use to think about that? And over and over, I am placed into these frames, and these are the frames that I want to talk to you about today. We've normalized our system, number one, of sovereignty, property, and jurisdiction. We've normalized that. And then what we're going to make decisions, we have to say, well, what values do we want to use? And our values are increasingly oppositional. Are we going to go with the jobs? Are we going to go with the preservation? Do we care about culture? Is it OK to talk about the sacred? Can you talk about it in the public sphere? Maybe you should leave that out. It might offend somebody. It might turn somebody off. Oppositional thinking is increasingly prevalent. And I want to caution us against our tendency to do that, but also with the utmost humility, because I think it's very easy to slip into that in our passion for the things that each of us care about and the communities that sometimes we don't encounter. I haven't been to the coal mining communities of Appalachia. I thank you for bringing them into the room. I think that's important. And then I want to talk about the frames, the, the green the Green New Deal, the transitional thinking, justice, equity, inclusion. And then I want to turn to self-determination, the human rights frame, and what we can do in our thinking to transcend just at the level of value, just at the level of consciousness, to transcend some of those things that we perceive as dichotomies, but they're not. The people who write on intercultural communication tell us that people's ways of thinking are situated. They're situated in cultural identity, in histories. They're situated in places. And we don't all occupy the same places, histories, identities, and cultures. So we have a hard time understanding each other. And in contemporary discourse, people say, well, that's the reason they get public comment, right? Everybody weighs in, and maybe you can get people in a public space and they can share ideas, and if I don't stop talking, they will never share ideas, and Scott's, Scott's in charge of me. You have to discipline me, all right? Okay. But that, that's the challenge, that we have all these different starting places, and so that kind of mix of discourse is increasingly turning into this ugly, polarized, name-calling, assigning identities that don't even belong. And so the way to overcome that is to understand how people do interact with their environment, the phenomenology that forms consciousness, that forms thinking. We fall into these traps, normalizing them, but we in fact can escape them. And there are many cultures, many indigenous cultures, cultures in, in Asia that believe that it's okay to hold two opposite thoughts at the same time because our universe is holistic and interdependent and it's constantly changing. It's not fixed at all. Of course you can have things that seem opposite, but they're in fact the twin parts of the whole. And if we thought that way, then we would have a different lens for imagining our survival.
in the years to come. Are there any climate deniers in this audience? No. So we can actually move forward. See, that's a victory. That is a victory, and I thank you for that. Okay. So the whole idea of the jobs versus environment, that was kind of, um, you know, the, the call of the panel. And I thought about that carefully when I was preparing the remarks for this because I had just been inundated with the whole idea of the closure of Navajo Generating Station, the, the families there that were dependent on those jobs, and they were good jobs, and they were good paying jobs, and there was a 40-year kind of time period that the community became very dependent on the coal mine and the jobs, and of course, it had to shut down because it was no longer economically viable. That is why nearly 600 coal mines have shut down across the nation in the last 10 years because they're not economically viable. Not because people are mean or because the environment this or jobs that are, they're not economically viable. Now what does that do with a dependent community? And I really appreciated um, the, the last panel for, for again talking about that. And there was kind of a last ditch effort to say, well, maybe the Navajo Nation should buy that power plant. I mean, I bought the Peabody coal mine, and maybe because they were vulnerable and they were marginalized and they were poor, that you should make an exemption. So all the other coal mines, I don't know about the Appalachian people, but at least for these people on the Navajo Nation, they could preserve the coal economy into the future, and they could buy that. How were they going to do that? Well, they had a trust fund set up by Peterson Zaw when he was chairman and then president because he knew, he saw into the future and saw that that economy was going to be for a duration, but it was not in perpetuity. And he wanted the people to have a share of that proceeds sustainable into the future. That was a great way of thinking. Does the United States do that? Is there a sustainability fund for this country, for its energy transition? You guys know more about this than me. Anybody raise your hand if you think that the United States established a sustainability fund for when the coal industry goes by the wayside? So that's... That's the, the mythology of this. The economy has its own momentum, but it's not separate and apart from the facts of what is going on with the environment. So the Navajo Nation did not buy that, and the power plant closed, and SRP found jobs for, I think, 400 of the 500 people and other plants. But the lease revenues that were coming to the tribe, those did stop. The Hopi tribe they estimated 80% of their annual revenues was tied to that. And that is, that is something that we really have to consider um, as we consider the, the transition in energy economies. What I would like to do, building on Sarah's amazing 2018 article on justice and sustainability, and she made a number of amazing points in that article, but two that I'm going to piggyback on here. Number one point, she said, federal Indian law and conservation work together to create the circumstance that we have now because it divested most of the land in this country from the indigenous presence on the land. And that is the, the image that I want to unite in our imagining of the public lands as an entity, they were one and the same with the people. The people were taken off of that. And that is true that that was the first public lands giveaway, right? The public domain, let's have homesteaders, let's have people come in and settle the West. Let's give them this opportunity in the new land. And whoa, what about the tribes? Some reservations, downsize the reservations, downsize again, downsize again, allotment until you're left with this. And that was in the name of the public good. The second very powerful point that she makes is that we have 
adopted a framework of moral thinking around that to where the old policy was to exploit in environmental law. But then we exercised moral progress like the Wilderness Act and said, now we're going to preserve. We are enlightened. We're not going to waste all of our public lands. We're going to have these important, amazing places. Now, the Wilderness Act is great, but it is a place devoid of people. There are no people in the wilderness. If we are going to adopt an ethic of sustainability that works into the future, the people, as Alan said, have to be part of the environment. It is a landscape in which people, human beings, and the land are intertwined inseparably. And so that has been much of the public lands debate. Well, on those lands, can indigenous peoples come in? Do they have to pay some park fees? Can they harvest medicines? Do they need a permit? What if they go gathering food, this, that, and the other? Bringing them back into the space ever so selectively to make sure we don't destroy all the other values. Okay, here are the frames. Do I have time to talk about frames? How much? Five minutes. Okay. Okay. Save a couple minutes for questions. All right. I will. So the standard framework of sovereignty and property and jurisdiction is great, but it is incomplete. Yes, the United States owns the lands, but we are also the owners. What's our relationship to the United States? Same thing with tribal lands, tribal trust lands. The United States obviously has a presence in that and has treated native lands for many purposes the same as the policies for energy development and exploitation as it has for the public lands. So we are saddled with that history, but it does give us jurisdictional boundaries that are important. The oppositional frameworks we've talked about, and those are increasingly complicated, and I want to talk about them in the context of sacred sites because I have very limited time frame. Bears Ears National Monument was an extraordinarily important effort. Thank you, Charles, and thank you to all of the indigenous leaders that drove this movement to create a monument. And in the language that President Obama used, he acknowledged the sacred nature of those lands and the continuing presence of native peoples on their ancestral lands for a variety of practices and purposes, and that is right in the proclamation. Traditional knowledge about the lands is described as an invaluable resource that resides with the people, and that is the central point of that. The knowledge about the place, the wisdom sits in places, the people translate that, and it is intertribal and intercultural. Intercultural communication worked in that context to highlight the importance of that knowledge in that area. Politically, it was important because for the first time, there was a commission that would join the federal land managers, and the commission was composed of five representatives from five of the federally recognized tribes that had ancestral ties to that area. And that was in addition to the advisory council, the stakeholder mode. For those reasons, Bears Ears is a historic act, and the dismantling of it by 85% reduction into two non-contiguous areas and the recent revision in the management plan, as well as the lack of consultation, is something that could, should concern every person in this room. And it is highlighted as well by the effort to remove and limit public comment on many decisions for public lands and to punish people as protesting, as blocking and limiting national security in a way that under some new state criminal laws is actually a criminal act if you protest the development of certain lands. So we should be very concerned about that because that is anti-democratic. Um, 
Chaco Canyon is another site where a lot of this is happening. Um, let me wrap up by saying that the Green New Deal, I think for all of the reasons that we have talked about, gives us a language, it gives us a language about a transition in energy economies that can and should be just, and it also gives an opportunity for disadvantaged and marginalized communities to be part of the process of reclaiming a, an equity across rural and urban communities if we design it appropriately. So I like that part of it. What I'm going to leave you with though is that the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation that is attached to that is becoming one of those binaries with conservative versus progressive influences. And that is unfortunately going to impact the, the way that energy economies are basically considered into the future. So we have to be careful about the animosity that is being expressed against those marginalized communities because that, that really shouldn't be part of the design of an equitable energy system and yet it is implicit in the pushback about that. And the last thing I'll say is that inclusion for Native nations is as nations. The justice, as Sarah said in her article, is justice as nations. It is not the ethnic minority, poor, disadvantaged, marginalized, although in many cases the communities are, they have those characteristics too. But the nation to nation relationship is what we can't let go of. And here I have been so um, profoundly moved by some of the work that has come out of sustainable reservation economies after Standing Rock. And a group of women recently got together um, who were leaders in that movement and they said, you know, really part of what happened at Standing Rock galvanized us, right? We got the whole world at Standing Rock talking to each other. It was intertribal, it was global. People brought their skills. If people could give medicine, they gave medicine. If they could give knowledge, they gave knowledge. If they could give food, they gave food. They took care of each other, that sense of community because we all resisted the exploitive ethic of these extractive industries. But the lesson they learned in their community after that, after everybody left, was that they didn't have to ask any government for food, for energy, or for the right to survive as a community in the ways that they knew. That was the power that they always had. So that cultural sovereignty that came from the community has inspired a, a movement toward food sovereignty, which is so inspirational. I'll be talking about that in Utah next month, but it is, it is amazing. And the lesson here is really that we all can come together with that powerful spirit, with that mind, with that unified consciousness. It sits in place. It embraces all of us. It is embodied in those lands that we love. Thank you so much. Well, thanks to all three of our panelists. Um, as I hopefully previewed, the idea was to kind of take us outside the box of some of the historical thinking on when we think of traditional public land policy making and um, kind of push the envelope a bit in other, you know, to provide us thoughts on other ways we could approach some of these issues. I know we're at the 12 o'clock hour, and I know Jess has to catch an airplane. But um, just allow a couple minutes for questions. Does anybody have anything they'd like to visit with the panel about? Back here in the corner. Thanks for the great panel. I'm curious about your opinions regarding who is the agency on the traditional native side in Alaska and other places, agency was by the community for the community rather than for other interests. Thanks for your thoughts on this. So that's an excellent question. And by agency, in the traditional sense, a lot of, a lot of tribes would say that there was an incredible responsibility located in the decision maker wherever that 
power resided. It could be a council, it could be a person, it could be a lot of places, but there was an incredible responsibility to act for the collective well-being, but that was a considered well-being. A community is much more able to do that, and that's why a lot of the, the Native nations that had bands, so not just one huge nation, but they actually had autonomous bands, the Navajo Nation had that, um, that, that made collective decisions within theirs, but they had to come together and unite um, in order to make any decisions that were larger. What happened in Alaska, I think, was, was hard with the um, Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act because, again, the United States processed power in a way that had residual and longstanding harms for community decision-making. Thank you, Scott, for moderating safe travels.